गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन विल बी स्टार्टिंग सून सो आस्क ऑल ऑफ फ्रेंड्स एंड हुएवर इज इंटरेस्टेड इन द प्रोग्राम टू जॉइन books will be starting uh, in around 2 minutes call your friends asap and if any of you has any problem hearing uh, my voice right now or seeing the screen please type it in the chat
So uh, let's get started with the session. Welcome to the Neural Art Workshop. Today is day zero, and we'll be discussing some basics of Python, a few libraries, and in the second half, we'll be discussing the basics of neural networks and a little bit on GANs. So you can understand and appreciate the uh, guest lectures coming forward on day one and day two. Here's how the flow of this uh, lecture is supposed to go. First of all, we'll discuss Python origins. How exactly uh, Python came about to be the way it was? Just a little bit about that. Just uh, a few slides. Fine. After that, we'll uh, look into how lists are in Python and why it's so fundamental to uh, look at the behavior per se. Then we'll look at how tuples are different from lists. Then we'll look at sets, dictionaries, and then we'll generalize this it all with sequences in Python. After that, we'll look at NumPy and in short uh, on TensorFlow. So uh, you guys have received uh, on your mail, like whoever has registered have received on your mail, some PDFs containing uh, some material on NumPy, TensorFlow and basic Python. You can refer to that to uh, study in, in a little bit greater detail about NumPy and TensorFlow. We won't be going into much depth because of lack of time. This is a Python refresher to help you understand better. So uh, first of all, let's uh, look at this code. This code is basically about this language called ABC on which Python is heavily based. So in that, uh, there are a bunch of operations which are defined for these three types, texts, lists, and tables, and they work on all of these three equally because all of these three satisfy some conditions and are grouped in this particular group called trains. We'll look at how this is relevant to the Python scenario. So uh, let's get started with the list refresher in Python. So if you are on a Linux machine, uh, just open up your terminal and type Python 3. Same goes for Mac. And in case of Windows, uh, you need to have Python installed on your device. Just type Python and an interactive Python shell will open, which will look somewhat like uh, this section of my slides. If you have any difficulty with that, uh, please type that in the chat. Okay, has the recording not started? Just a second. Yep, we'll uh, start the recording right now. Cool, it has started. I think I'll uh, go over the first slide again. So, yep, we just discussed uh, how exactly uh, Python uh, basically came about to be the way it was. A lot of it is structured to uh, group properties into uh, common structures to sort of make it more uh, usable as well as readable. Fine. Then we were discussing lists in Python and this entire tutorial runs on a bunch of interactive prompt commands. So uh, I asked you guys to open up the interactive uh, Python shell in your terminals. The uh, Windows people just uh, open up CMD, the command prompt and type in Python. So once you've done that, uh, you can sort of initialize a list like this. L equals 0, 1, 2, 3 will initialize a list. And when you look at the list, you can see the same list you initialize. One other syntax you might not be familiar with is called a list comprehension. Now, most of you are aware uh, of the for loop syntax. Now I want you guys to listen to this line carefully. I for I in range 4. For i in range 4 is basically the syntax of a for loop. And what we are doing is we are taking up i and making this particular i a part of a list for this particular for loop. Similarly, we can uh, have more conditions like this i for i in range 10 if i is less than 4. Similarly, i minus 1 for i in range 1 to 5. All of these things basically output the same list. So you can see how Python has this powerful uh, syntax uh, inside the uh, list uh, syntax itself. This is called list comprehension and it is used to write uh, readable as well as efficient code. One other way to make a list is the multiplication syntax. If you want to initialize a list, you can simply take a list with one variable, use the multiplication syntax and then look at the list. So here, uh, the green ones are the outputs. You can see we have a list which has been initialized with the same values like this. 
if we change one of the values it gets changed as we would expect now most of you have done the basic programming and data structures course and you are aware how uh, array assignment and uh, accessing works using the square bracket syntax if there is any doubt regarding the same please type it in the chat it will be uh, resolved at the earliest and also don't forget to uh, type all of these commands uh, parallel to the uh, tutorial so we can also have a nested list like this and the 2d arrays square bracket syntax like c also works here we can access uh, the uh, nested list using two square brackets and assign a value so here what we did is we made a list which basically contains three sub lists which are same as the previous problem we have this list we assign to the first element of the first sub list and then we try to assign in the place of the first sub list itself now what if we want to sort of save some work and use the multiplication syntax again and again we get the same initial list but when we try to assign to it you will see that all of these uh, like list will uh, get changed all of these sub lists will get changed i want you guys specifically to try this one does anyone have any idea about why this happens so what we did is we ran the multiplication two times just like the previous list this one we did a multiplication created a list multiplied it again and created another list but when we change the first sub list the second and third ones change as well so if anyone knows how and why this happens please write it in the chat it's, it's a nice problem to ponder about so if you missed any of what uh, was just discussed here's a small recap for you we discussed list comprehension a more readable and efficient syntax in python which basically involves the idea of a for loop inside a list syntax we also realized that list comprehensions are incredibly powerful and flexible we can involve functions as well as if else conditions inside a list comprehension we also looked how we can use the multiplication operator in the list as well we can we also saw we can use nested access uh, by the two square bracket syntax just like we uh, used to in uh, lower la uh, lower level languages like c so uh, here on i'll uh, hand over to nisar uh, he'll sort of walk you over through some list methods after that we'll discuss some generalizations uh, nisar please take over yeah so as we already seen how can we initialize lists and how can we access different data members of a list now we will see how can we add data to a list and remove it from a list so to add data into a list we have two different ways to do it one is the append function and another is the extend function so uh, when using the append function what it would do is whatever argument you give to that function it would just add it to the last it would add it as a last element to the list uh, as a one single element for example in this code here uh when we do l dot append 3 it would append 3 at the end of the list but the thing to notice here is uh when i will do l dot append a list 4 comma 5 it won't uh, add 4 and 5 as two separate elements it would append the list 4 comma 5 as the last element so this is something which uh, uh, we have to be careful about while using the append function uh, can you please move the slides yes the the next function is extend function so the way in which the extend function de uh, differs from the append function is the extend function would add the all the iterable items in the input you give to the list for example uh, if you can see the code here when we type l dot extend uh, list 3 comma 4 it doesn't add the list 3 comma 4 at the end of the uh, original list it adds 3 and 4 as two separate quantities into the list uh you can also pass tuples here uh, or a, a list here it doesn't matter but uh, the thing to note here is if you try to give it a single number let's say 6 as 6 is not an iterable it is a single number it won't add it it would give you an error uh, if you would you can try it uh, if you have opened the terminal you can just try it now you can see a similar error would pop up
now if you have already tried to add elements to a list the next thing we would see is how to remove them from the list so there are three different ways in which you can remove them one is the remove function other is the delete keyword and there is also a pop function so how this all works is the remove function uh, whatever argument you give it would try to search that element into the given list once it finds that item it would remove it from the list is as simple as that uh, for example in this code here when we write l dot remove 3 it drops 3 from the uh, it drops 3 as an element of the list but uh, another thing to note here is if you pass something that is not a part of a list it won't return something negative 1 or uh, a normal uh, like say return value and move on it would legit give an error so your code would stop so this is something you have to note if you try to remove something which is not present in your to your list it might create some problems now next is the delete keyword so a delete keyword is in general used to delete any item and it can also be applied on individual members of a uh, list so how we approach this is uh, instead of giving the actual value we have to provide the index of the list uh, using the square bracket notations so here when we type delete l3 what it does it it would uh, check the third indexed element and it would remove it so for example here if we see 0 is the 0th index 1 is first index 2 is second index and 3 is the third index so when i type delete l3 it would drop the 3 from the list uh, as can be seen from the output uh, with the delete keyword you can also use splicing as we do for getting the data or changing it so splicing works for delete keyword as well and uh, obviously if you would try to put something which is out of bounds of the list it too is going to throw an error similar to the delete keyword there is the pop uh, function what the pop function would do is it would also take the index as an input and it would remove the that index element from the list but uh, it would also return the deleted item so for example when you delete something you won't get that back but for in the case of pop function you can get the value which was popped out of the list as the return value uh, in other senses it is similar to delete uh, similarly in pop function if you try to delete something which is out of bounds it would just, just throw an error so now to recap uh, to add and remove items from a list we use append extend remove pop or delete what append does it does is uh, it would add the input given as a whole as a single element at the end of the list what extend will do is it would add each and every iterable item of the list uh, to the end of the list. So for example, a single list given to the extend would be passed as individual inputs and it would be added to the list. What remove does it, it would search for a specific item and it would remove it from the list, whereas pop and delete would be provided an index and that index item would be removed. Uh, now you got a oh, quite an overview of how lists work in Python. Uh, we would discuss about methods in Python. Uh, as most of you might be familiar with functions in C, Python also has some similar functions like len and odd. But as Python is an object oriented language, uh, all these methods are called by or on by instance of classes. So if this doesn't make sense, you can think of it in this way. In the last few slides, we are using some of the functions like append, extend. So all this were fun. It, all this were methods of a class named list, and they were giving us some specific met, uh, functionalities uh, to do on a list. So this is how uh, func functions can be used as methods in Python. Now. Uh, what is the basic difference between a list and a tuple? Uh, when we see it from an overview, they look quite similar, uh, don't they? Uh, like for example, here we uh, define a list and a tuple. The only difference uh, which appears is like the use of different kind of brackets. Uh, so we define a list 0, 1, 2, 3, a tuple 0, 1, 2, 3, and then we uh, index them at 0, 0. When, this, when we splice them using semicolon 3, uh, the, all the behavior seems uh, similar. 
but there is a basic difference. Now the basic difference would be uh, quite uh, visible when we try to change some element of these uh, items. For example, let's say if I try to change the zeroth index element of the list to four, it easily changes. But when I try to do this same for tuple, it gives me an error. So why this error comes is uh, the, there is a basic difference between lists and tuples. The difference is a list is mutable, whereas a tuple is immutable. Now you might think what even does it mean to be mutable or immutable? So it is just a fancy way of saying uh, mutable means you can be changed after you have been once declared. Whereas in case of a immutable item, you cannot change it once it has been declared. Uh, we would uh, go through this topic in more detail when we discuss uh, about sequences in general. Now there are also other types of sequences in Python like sets and dictionaries. So sets in Python are similar to sets in mathematics. Let's say uh, they are unordered and uh, no duplicates are kept in a uh, set just like uh, in a mathematical equivalent of the sets. And what a dictionary is, it is a basic uh, key to value mapping. Uh, so for example, in, we can see here uh, when in the output you can see there is a key file which links to a data point called zero. There is a key name four which links to a data point named one. So and how this was produced is using uh, something similar to list comprehension, uh, but as it is done on a dictionary, we would say it is dictionary comprehension. So comprehension is also compatible with dictionaries. Uh, yep, so here we discussed a bunch of uh, sequences in Python. Now we'll look in the uh, look uh, uh, look in the properties of general uh, sequence in Python. But before we continue with that, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask you guys to have, uh, if you guys have any doubts, uh, please ask right now. Like if you have asked them in the chat and you're not clear with them yet, you can unmute and ask. If there are any doubt, uh, please uh, go ahead and ask. So um, assuming there are no doubts, if there are, please uh, feel free to write in the chat. Uh, they will be promptly answered. For now, uh, we'll uh, continue with discussing the general sequence properties in Python. So uh, in Python, we looked at a bunch of sequences and we saw that they have common properties. We saw list comprehension and now we have this thing called set comprehension. We saw that tuples and lists behave so similarly. They have the same square bracket syntax and whatnot. Slicing works on everything and comprehensions are there for everything. We can iterate over them in loops. So what basically makes everything possible? So for that, we'll first of all look into a few classifications. In Python, there are some sequences called container sequences like list, tuple, and dqs. These sequences can, can contain different types of objects. Like one object can be an integer, other can be a string, and the third one can be a list as well. Like a list can contain anything, right? So how this is possible is this, these uh, sequences act as arrays of references. In C, the analog is basically an array of pointer. You can make a pointer point to anything, right? So that is how uh, this thing works. Basically references to multiple objects are stored. But in case of flat sequences, you can't store multiple types of elements in the same sequence. Why? Because instead of storing references, these sequences actually store the object itself. The examples of this are string, bytes, byte array, memory view, and array dot array. And then uh, there's this important classification which we just came across when discussing lists and tuples. Some sequences are mutable. They can be changed after you've first initialize them. Fine. Such sequences uh, include list, byte array, array dot array, collections dot dq, and memory view. In contrast, there are some sequences called immutable sequences, which cannot be changed that way, like tuple, str, and bytes. Now, one natural question is, can I create my own sequence? So first of all, a mutable sequence, let's just look at the formal definition. 
a sequence type whether it's built in or it's user defined which can be changed after being defined once is called a mutable sequence but what even is a sequence in python let's look into the technical definition so before we start with that there's this small recap a container is basically something which stores the reference of the objects it stored not the object itself it can store objects of multiple types an example is list and another common example is tuple then there are flat sequences the sequences which store the object themselves these sequences are only of one these sequences store objects of just one type they do not store objects of multiple types some common examples are strings and bytes mutable sequences these are the sequences in general which can change after they have been once initialized or defined common examples are list or byte array immutable sequences can't be changed after once initialized common examples are tuple or string so now let's come back to the question we just had what even is a sequence how do we know if a particular data structure is a sequence i can make a class by myself and i can have let's say 10 different fields in that class but is it a sequence so in python such things are defined by behaviors as we just discussed in python python being an object oriented language there is this concept of methods a particular class is endowed with a particular set of methods which decides its behavior fine so in python there are abstract classes which are basically there in collections.abc and they tell you different types of behavior so here we can say this this one type of behavior called container this one type of behavior called iterable which basically tells you can iterate on a particular uh, like structure and there's this particular behavior called size a sequence is basically uh, something which implements all of these three types of behavior basically that means it has the function corresponding to that uh, behavior a very easy and simple to understand example is the len fine we have often used the len uh, function ourselves at some point of time right what this does is this gives us the size of our particular object so if our particular object has defined in itself in its class body like jo bhi hum uska class define kiye in its class body if there is a dunder len function then our object will be uh, said to be a sized object if we have an dunder iter uh, like a uh, dunder iter method define our object will be iterable and so on a sequence basically defines these particular set of uh, like uh, methods in itself and hence has a particular type of behavior and so it is called a sequence a mutable sequence is basically something which has all the behavior of a sequence but some extra behaviors which also make it changeable now this might be quite a mouthful for you and you might just be like what just happened but as a great man once said don't worry about it if you don't understand for now i'll once again uh, like invite any and all questions you guys might have the initial parts are simple if there are any doubts right now please please feel free to ask you can ask on the chat and if you're not uh, being like if you're not understanding uh, whatever the response there is please feel free to unmute and ask right now I'll wait can I just say seconds. in general what to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, can I just say in general what is the dunder function is different from normal function? Yeah, sure. Let me tell you. So uh, I think your doubt basically is how are dunder functions different from special functions? Like, sorry, in regular methods which we define, how are dunder yes. methods different? Yep, yep. So what happens is like uh, a regular method. What it does is like non-dunder method. You just add it to uh, give your uh, particular class a certain type of behaviors. What happened is there are some types of behaviors which are very very fundamental or uh, in Python. Like you might have uh, come across the with statement, right? With open file name as if something like that. Fine. So that sort of behavior when you have to open a bunch of files and close them became very common. So what Python developers did is they came up with dunder methods for these things so for that if you implement dunder ender and dunder exit in your uh, like particular class you can use it in a with statement how that helps is if you are considering a particular class and you are writing a library code you basically use a dunder method in the internal implementation so if now someone else writes their own class 
and they have defined the same dunder method and your library code uses the dunder method they can now utilize your library like a common example is quite often let's say you are uh, making a french deck class in that you have a deck of cards fine you have a deck of cards and you have defined the iter method and len method on that you can already use it in the uh, for in the like uh, declarative for loop syntax you can also use this class with the random module you can use the random module function to sample from this so these dunder methods basically form an internal structure of the python object model and basically tell some basic behaviors which are so common that they have been standard in the internal implementation of python as well as some of the common libraries or uh, did that help I think Sayantan, uh, Sayantan. Uh, if I'm not, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, sorry. I think it was your doubt. Is it clear? Yeah, partially clear. Uh, okay. You can ask what you're not clear with. Like we do have some time on our hands. We can try to explain. Just, just ask away, man. No problem. Uh, I think not. It's fine. So if yeah. you guys, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. I'm trying to understand. Okay, okay, cool. You're trying to understand. Yes, sir. Fine. Yeah. So dunder methods are very fundamental to Python. They basically determine the internal workings and structure of uh, Python as a language. If you guys want to uh, read about that more, you can reach out to me. I'll uh, like tell you about this really epic book I found. So, yep. Let's now uh, start with the NumPy uh, library, which is fairly common in data science. It's uh, so common because it basically allows you to write elegant vec vectorized and declarative code. It's fast as well as uh, it basically lets you write uh, be, uh, like code faster as well. The syntax becomes better. So for this part, I again uh, ask Nisar to take over. Yes, uh, as already mentioned, uh, NumPy helps us to vectorize our code. What NumPy basically is, it is a linear algebra library of Python, which helps us to uh, write more efficient code, more uh, parallelized code uh, using the vector and matrix implementations. So while using NumPy, uh, this is a list of uh, some of the most common functions uh, we use. So, for example, the uh, first one is the np.linearalgebra.inverse. So, as the name suggests, it uh, takes the matrix inverse of the input numpy matrix we give it. Uh, then there is np.linearalgebra.eigen. So, it uh, calculates the eigenvalues of the given matrix. Then there is np.mat multiplication. So, uh, as this is also fairly simple. It would matrix multiply their two given matrices. Then there is np dot zeros. So this function would return a numpy matrix uh, which has the zeros and it would give you the you will provide some dimensions and it would give you the uh, numpy matrix with zeros filled with those dimensions. Then there is np dot a range. It works similar to the range function in Python where you give it a start point, a stop point and a step size and uh, it would create a, ma a matrix with those elements. Then there is np dot identity. Uh, it uh, is fairly simple. It would give you an identity matrix of a given size. Then there is np dot v stack. Uh, what np dot v stack does is uh, when you provide it with two arrays, it vertically stacks them. Like uh, if you try to visualize it, uh, there is one array and there is another array. It is being vertically stacked. And similarly, there is also an h stack which does this horizontally. Now, uh, while working with NumPy, you might uh, get some bugs and uh, you might try to debug them. So while doing this, these are some of the things which might be helpful. So first is the array dot shape. So you might think, why is this useful? Uh, but uh, as we all know, matrix uh, are dimensionally specific. So you cannot multiply or add any matrix with anything. So sometimes uh, you might get error codes like uh, dimensions aren't matching or something. So for that, uh, using error dot shape might be useful. Then there is error dot d type, which would give you the data type of the elements of an array. 
then there is type stuff which is like a general python thing it would return the data type of the variable given inside then there is also this import pdb pdb dot set trace so uh, how this will help you is like for example your code is not working but you are exactly not sure uh, where the code is like uh, breaking so using this you can set a breakpoint and try to figure out uh, where the error exactly is so this is some fairly uh, complex stuff if you want to know about it you can read the python documentations then there are app strings which were introduced in python 3 they help you to like write uh, strings in a better format uh, it is an improvement of the for dot format uh, format and it is named app strings Now, uh, after we have known the various functions in NumPy, uh, how do we even create a NumPy array? So there are various different ways to do this, but the most common way to be follow is we take an uh, Python list and we convert it to an NP, NP array. So here, as you can see, firstly we import NumPy as MP, then we uh, do array equals to NP dot array of this list 0, 1, 2, 3. So what this does is it would convert this list into a NumPy array which is the same values and this is not only applicable for 1D matrices or vectors. We can do this for multiple uh, dimensional uh, matrices such as if you do 0, 1 list, comma 2, 3 list, it would create a matrix as you can see here. And uh, as we have already seen the np.0s function, if you pass a tuple uh, with the dimension 2, comma 2, it would give you a 2, 2 cross 2 matrix with all zeros. Now, uh, after we have known how do we create uh, NumPy arrays, uh, we will see how we apply operations on those arrays. So uh, how all the operations are implemented in NumPy is uh, they have been parallelized to each and every element of the uh, array. So for example, when we do array equals to array plus 5, what it would do is it would add 5 not to one element of the array, it would do it to each and every element. For example, the input uh, array was 0, 1, 2, 3, which was transformed to 5, 6, 7, 8 after the plus 5 operation. The multiplication or for that matter, subtraction and division or any of the most common mathematical operators are implemented in similar way where they are applied to each and every element of the matrix. Some of the common mathematical functions like square root, log, sine have also been implemented by NumPy in a similar fashion where each and every element is modified. Now, uh, this is a, a brief overview and recap of NumPy. So what actually was NumPy? It was a package for vector and matrix manipulation, broadcasting and vectorization, and it helps us uh, save time and amount of code. Uh, these were some of the common functions we use in NumPy. And uh, these were also, there were also some of the common debugging tools which might be useful. And uh, there might be a question running in your mind. Uh, why do we even need to parallelize the code? How, why do we even need to vectorize the code? So for this, uh, this is like an activity which you can try. Uh, try making a list which has some elements and uh, try doing this uh, operation, let's say adding five to it uh, using a for loop and uh, try to check how much time it, it takes. Then try to do this similar task using NumPy and its operations. Uh, you will see a significant amount of difference in time. So that is why we need to do this. If you want to know more about parallelization, uh, you can check the details which have been given here and uh, some more details have also been given in the slides which were provided to you via the mail. And yeah, if uh, this doesn't make sense, uh, don't worry uh, if you don't understand. Uh, now, after we have seen what NumPy was, uh, it was a matrix uh, manipulation or a vector manipulation uh, library. TensorFlow is something similar, but with tensors. But the first question you might have is, what even are tensors? So the way in which I would like to put it is, 
firstly we had some numbers so they were like if you would like to say it in that way they were zero dimensional there was one number then we made a sequence which was a many numbers uh, in a horizontal or a vertical way whichever you seem to like them then we saw matrices which were like 2d representation of numbers now uh, as we try to increase this dimensionality uh, we try to make a generalized name a generalized quantity mathematical quantity which is called as tensors so everything that was a single number a uh, sequence a matrix or even higher dimensional for example 3d matrices or 4d matrices all of these are considered as tensors so uh, the use of these tensors is made very easy by using tensor flow uh, in many ways it is comparable to the numpy library it is similar in many ways but there are also some uh, nuances and differences uh, we were because of time constraints we were not able to cover each and every part of them but we have made a separate slide specifically on tensor flow and how to use it and provided that to you in the mail which might be very helpful so uh, here we would like to stop for a few time if you have any doubts you can ask yep so here's the thing we have not covered the numpy syntax as well as the tensor flow syntax in much greater detail because of shortage of time right after this we'll move to neural networks fine and we'll try to understand how they work before that we just wanted to give you a refresher on python and a basic idea of how and why we use a uh, certain types of python libraries uh, the primary uh, libraries which we discussed were basically numpy and tensor flow in numpy we basically have parallelized uh, operations for matrix matrix and all uh, and we have basically uh, like capabilities for that in parallel tensorflow is basically something which was uh, developed for google for general operations uh, of various types of uh, like math areas on a tensor and it was open source uh, some time back before that uh, the uh, popular alternative was theano uh, which was not as good it, it is sort of like an academic project you can say so uh, before we sort of move on with uh, neural networks i'll again uh, like to ask you guys if you have any doubts regarding any part of the presentation in the python recap i guess there are no doubts so uh, for right now we'll move to the uh, neural networks presentation to give you some idea of what basic machine learning and neural networks are because it is very fundamental uh, to the workshop as well as uh, whatever you might be learning after 20 30 minutes discussion there we'll give you guys a short break so is my uh, slide visible yep cool 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 yep so basically now we'll discuss neural networks and gans so first of all what uh, you need to do what basically you need to understand before we sort of get on with the uh, bread and butter of this presentation is what uh, neural nets are for what, uh, and how we model problems that's all fine so let's say we have a particular problem we want to predict the pricing of houses in a particular city we have all the information we want like uh, let's say how old the house is what the area of house is etc etc what a uh, problem that we wish to solve is what price the house is going to fetch us uh, when we try to sell it so this particular problem can be proposed as a function that we given some particular inputs whatever the properties of the house are and as an output we basically get a, a prediction for whatever price it will sell for and the model becomes more and more accurate as we sort of get nearer to the actual price it is sold at 
this and in machine learning algorithms what happens is we use a lot of data and we write a model such that this particular model sort of tries to learn from data itself and uh, then make predictions so in the entirety of machine learning the problem is sort of like taking up a bunch of data finding out a function to make a prediction and making a prediction we'll look into how neural networks fall into that picture why they are so powerful and so popular so this is how the flow of this presentation will be why exactly neural networks like why do you even use them why are so why are they so popular second how is the construction uh, of a neural network uh, like uh, how exactly is the structure the internals of the neural networks after that we'll look into the training after that in short we'll uh, go over what exactly generative adversarial neural networks or gans are then in short we'll go over overfitting in neural networks and why it's a concern now i'll ask you guys to like sort of keep in mind this bigger picture like the flow of this lecture otherwise like samajh jame thoda issue ho jayega like it this stuff might be new for a lot of you guys so it will help if you have a mental picture of whatever is happening first of all we'll see why neural networks so basically as i said in machine learning we basically want to have a function to solve a particular problem right and what we want is we put in a bunch of data and basically our problem uh, basically the neural, the uh, model trains and uh, creates a function which solves our problem neural network is basically a function and uh, the structure of neural network is such that it can basically map any function to ridiculous amounts of accuracy it's like whatever accuracy you want for whatever function in the world you can get it with a single hidden layer neural network you can design a neural network in such a way that you can get that accuracy now you guys would have studied limits in your first year i believe so the formal definition is if we have a function f of x that we wish to compute in some desired accuracy we wish to approximate in some desired accuracy epsilon greater than 0 then a neural network with uh, then there always exists a neural network with output g of x which satisfies this given condition that the difference between the magnitude of difference between gx and fx is less than epsilon so what this means is whatever function we find out we can always find a neural network to basically approximate it although there are a lot of practical challenges into how that happens and the second thing is why exactly deep learning it's like we had a bunch of machine learning algorithms which were doing something something why such boom in deep learning and neural network suddenly so what happened is as the older uh, like learning algorithms are used and the amount of data they have to encompass uh, increases the complexity of these networks these models generally fails you have more complex data and you have a lot of data and you wish to uh, decode and some information from that particular set of data so as the amount of data increases deep learning methods basically become a necessity so before we continue with the internal structure of a neural network i want you guys to ask if you have any doubts regarding neural networks or uh, the basics of machine learning like what we are trying to do if you have any doubt please uh, please ask uh, if there are any doubts I guess there are no doubts. If there are any doubts, if you want to ask something, please uh, write it in the chat. Now we'll look into the internal structure of a neural network. Now you might find it difficult to understand what is happening because you don't know what a neuron or a layer is. Right now, what we uh, the approach we are taking is we'll tell you guys a bunch of definitions first, like what a neuron is, what a layer is, uh, an example of a layer, like fully fully connected layer and so on, what weights are. and after that we'll give you the whole picture of what a neural network actually is what the structure is like so to give you this uh, like internal structure overview i'll uh, call upon nisarg again uh, nisarg please take over yeah so uh, as yatendra already pointed out uh, the neural network is a function uh, but how do we make this a big function we do this using small sub functions so this sub functions are neurons so what basically a neuron is 
it gets some weighted input it uh, sums them and then it uh, applies an activation function onto them and passes the output to the next entity so a neuron is basically which gets something and it's it gives something out uh, and uh, what an activation function is what weights are don't worry about them now uh, we would uh, try to explain you what those are uh, in the next coming slides now so uh, as i said a neuron would get some input and it would give some output so this inputs are weighted so now what does it actually mean the inputs to be weighted so uh, you can think of weights as an uh, implication of how important a connection of one neuron to the another is so those weights are actually between two neurons of two different layers so now you might think what even a layer is so a layer is a vertical stack of such neurons which are not internally connected so when we get a connection between two different neurons we call uh, we give it a weight and this weight uh, in a way signifies how important that connection is now uh, as you know what a layer is there are three different types of layers normally in a neural network so there is an input layer which directly sees the input given by the user and then there are this so called hidden layers what this hidden layers do they get the their input from the input layer or some other hidden layers whichever might the case and uh, they pass their output to the next layers the last hidden layer would give its output to the output layer and this output layer is actually the output which the neural network spits out now uh, after you understood what a neuron is so we would see how the uh, actual picture looks like so uh, we have some input layers some hidden layers and an output layer uh, and the most uh, common way in which it is implemented is we connect each and every node of a single layer to each and every node of the next layer so and as they are connected uh, fully it's called a fully connected layer so what happens is each and every uh, node which is connected to each and every node of the next layer is given a weight and this weight is stored in an m cross n matrix where m is the number of perceptrons or you can say the neurons in that uh, previous layer and is n is the perceptron in the next layer and uh, there are also biases so what this biases are like uh, after to better understand to better grasp the uh, function we would add some biases so in a way what we are trying to do is we are trying to get some linear combination of the previous layers to the next layer but uh, and there is also an activation function so that is also to be kept in mind so as you can see in this diagram uh, there is some input being given then they are being weighted a weighted sum is being calculated and there is some step function which is actually the activation function in picture so you might think what is the use of an activation layer so if you think in, uh, in that way uh, there if there wasn't an activation layer what would happen is each and every of the node would be a linear combination of the previous nodes so all in all it would just become a linear combination of the input to the output which would mean we are just doing linear regression with its extra steps so to input some non linearity so that we can grasp the data better we include this activation function the activation function can also be thought of in a way like how much active a connection bit a neuron is yeah so here the diagram might help you understand better because this is a quite an abstract uh, topic so uh, if you would see in the diagram it would be better to grasp so for example we are getting some input from a neuron uh, then there are multiple such inputs which are being given then we are multiplying that input with some weight let's say w0 w1 w2 etc and all these weights are being summed up after they are being summed up there is some bias which we are adding uh, after this bias is added we are applying a function which we are calling it as activation function and this output is then passed on to the next neuron or if it is the last uh, layer it is just our output now you might think uh, what different kind of activation functions are even used so here are some examples of the activation functions 
So for example, here is the unit step function, which is basically zero for negative numbers, one for positive and 0.5 for zero. There is also a sine function, which is just uh, uh, the, the negative or the positive sign of the uh, input. Then there is the linear function, which is basically what is, what is the input is the output. Then there is a piecewise linear uh, function, which would uh, draw some line between two constants. Uh, here the limit is defined as minus from minus half to half. There is a linear line. Another two are constant at zero and one. Then there are also some completely non-linear activation functions. For example, the sigmoid or also known as the logistic function and the hyperbolic tangent function. The logistic and the sigmoid function uh, varies between zero to one and the hyperbolic one does between minus one to one. Uh, now you might think uh, there being so many uh, activation functions, what which of them to use? So the basic uh, thing to keep in mind during practice is use ReLU. Uh, but while doing so, be careful with your learning rates. Uh, you can also try out leaky ReLU, max out or ReLU activation functions. Uh, you can also try the hyperbolic tension functions, but uh, most cases it won't help much and it is not recommended to use the sigmoid function. Now we will take an outlook of whatever we saw. So as we saw, there was some input layers, output layers and hidden layers. So let's say there is some input given. Uh, those inputs are given to each and every node of the input layer. Then those input layers would pass on that information to the next layer via some biases. Those biases would be multiplied. A sum will be taken and another activation function would be applied. And this output would be transferred to the next layer. And this would keep on going until the last output layer. So after this is done, we would get some values as outputs. So this whole process of putting some data and getting an output is called a forward propagation because data is being propagated forward. And sometimes it is also called inference because in a way you are uh, putting some value and seeing the output. So you are inferring into your model. Now, uh, as we discussed about those hidden layers, so you might think how many hidden layers should I choose? Uh, so there are two, let's take some two extremes. For example, if we take very less number of uh, layers, so the model won't have enough complexity to understand the or grasp the data. It won't be able to uh, match the original function. So what would happen is it would uh, cause poor accuracy. But uh, on the other end, if we just give too many layers, what the model will start to do is it would start overthinking. It would read too much into the data and it would create some boundaries which will give you higher accuracies, but they won't generalize well in the uh, original world. What would happen is uh, it would just learn the data which is being provided. It won't think of it in recognizing patterns. So uh, this is something which we must be uh, thoughtful about. Uh, this is also called overfitting when we just give too many layers and uh, it learns something which it should not. Uh, we would try to cover this if time permits. And uh, after this, uh, there is a training of a neural network. So uh, after we have uh, seen the architecture, uh, how those weights and biases which we talked about are trained uh, would be discussed by Yatindra. OK, cool. So one thing I can notice is there are a lot of doubts in the chat. I'll sort of clarify them. And first of all, uh, just realize it's OK to have doubts because we did not actually explain how it happens. What we just did is we just told you a bunch of definitions and now we can explain to you guys how a neural network actually works. Uh, so what I want you guys to understand till now is what uh, like various parts of a neural network are. So you should be able to understand that there's something called a layer in a neural network because whatever like uh, architecture of a neural network is, it is divided up in a bunch of layers. Every layer is basically composed of neurons. You know what a neuron is. Neuron is basically something which takes up a bunch of outputs, calculates their sum, and after that passes the output to an activation layer, basically applying an activation function to the uh, output it just gave. And then 
that goes to the next layer so uh now let's try to sort of understand what happened and before that i'll try to take up some doubts from the chat uh, just a second so how can neural networks be functions when they can give multiple answers images uh nikhil it's basically like uh when you when you're training the output constantly changes but at any point of time when you give a particular uh, input when it is exact the uh, output basically remains the same it does not give two outputs for uh, one particular function for one particular image let's say you are doing a classification task it will just give one output if the training changes a little bit you can get more than one output so uh, akshay is basically asking what the hidden layers do so all that i'm going to explain this in full detail along with some mathematics as well just uh, and we'll be using some animation so it will be uh, very very easy to understand i'll give you guys a brief idea here what happens imagine this x1 x2 x3 and x4 are basically uh, pixels of some image fine and let's say we want to classify if the image is of a guy or the image of uh, image is of a girl by like looking at their face although that is very very difficult as well as controversial let's say someone try to train a, a neural network on this particular uh, situation so what happens is you take the value of this particular pixel and basically add it uh, with some random weights like you basically whatever uh, like lines you can see are basically weights you basically uh, initialize all of these weights randomly and then you calculate a weighted sum for each of these neurons and then using the input from these of uh, these neurons how it basically happens is you can sort of imagine that uh, the left side does not exist you basically gave an input and then the act, the uh, hidden layer basically acts as the input for the next hidden layer this hidden layer acts as the input for the next hidden layer and so on in this particular architecture of uh, fully connected layers every single uh, like neuron of one given layer is connected to every single neuron of the previous layer so that is just how the architecture is basically designed for this neural network so in the current example we'll take up a pixel basically calculate a weighted sum in this layer apply an activation function and provide input to this layer so these layers what they will do is they will try to uh, isolate features like as we train it we will change the weights in such a manner that the final output we get is the answer we want let's say we want a zero one answer just a, a single output if like the uh, uh, the person is male we uh, get an answer of one if female we get an answer of zero then we'll just have one single output and we'll uh, undertake some sort of procedure in which we change the weights in such a manner that these pixels will end up giving sort of uh, whatever answer we want and these hidden layers basically give you the space to do that ऐसा ही कुछ एडजस्ट करना पड़ेगा ना कि हम पिक्सल में क्या क्या मतलब मल्टीप्लाई uh, करेंगे क्या क्या फंक्शन में उसको डालेंगे जिससे हमें फाइनल आउटपुट वो मिल जाए सो दैट एडजस्टमेंट एंड द एंटायर प्रोसेसिंग इज डन बाय द इंटरनल द हिडन लेयर्स सो या आई होप दैट इज क्लियर नो एंड वाइल सो नो विल मूव ऑन टू ट्रेनिंग अ न्यूरल नेटवर्क हाउ दैट हैपन्स इज आई वॉन्ट यू गेस्ट टू लुक एट दिस चार्ट वेरी वेरी केयरफुली so compare it to this you throw a dart at one particular dart board you basically observe ki where the dart landed if you landed really far from the center where where you're supposed to land you realize you're doing something really wrong then you adjust the position of your hand to throw the dart in the correct place this is how you like sort of uh, put the dart in the correct place right when you are like simply playing a dart game so training a neural network is sort of similar what you do is you sort of put in a bunch of input after randomly initializing and calculate what the output of the neural network is giving let's say i have the same problem as i just discussed in this neural network i gave as input an image and i basically initialized all the weights to random values and i'll get a random and i don't know what kind of output fine what i'll do is then i'll use the error in my output to adjust my neural network so after that uh, i'll calculate some sort of loss and try to determine how wrong i was and then i'll use that information to correct so this is basically behind the scenes of training a perceptron 
we basically initialize all these neurons to random weights we calculate the output of our neural network for our input we basically uh, calculate the error and change the weight according to whatever the error was and then we repeat these steps until the error becomes so low and the output basically becomes uh, like very much what we want it to be and yes I'm, i've repeated this diagram for the third time because it's very very explanative so yep how it happens is we do a forward pass and how the changing of weight happens is we basically uh, try to differentiate the error function with respect to whatever uh, like weights are it's like let's say ki tumhare paas mein 10 weights hain tum basically derivative calculate karte ho apne error function ka uske respect mein to find out ki yaar error function is changing really really fast if i change this particular weight let me try to explain it via an example so let's say this is basically uh, this particular graph is basically the graph of the error function and the theta not and theta 1 let's say are the weights so you can see like if i change theta not a bit i basically move to a position where error function is basically low in value so what we try to do is we try to find the derivative of our particular uh, like error function with respect to the weights and try to find out which uh, like weight to change and how much and this particular step is called backward propagation so this is uh, just again an explanation of forward propagation we basically just calculate the outputs there is no learning and then when we are doing the backward pass we basically update the parameters like we change the weights to reduce the error and then we implement the derivative again so this is how the forward pass mathematically happens fine uh, this basically method just sort of uh, discusses the loss function uh, we do not need to uh, go over this in more detail in optimization we just discussed we basically try to reduce the loss function now uh, after two to three slides there will be an animation or uh, discussing back propagation so i'll just give you a mathematical idea before we see the animations and uh, then i'll also uh, give you guys a chance to ask for doubts so what happening here is let's say you have a loss l and you have this particular weight z here fine you calculated a derivative del uh, l by del z which tells you how much this loss reduces when you change z similarly uh, you use the chain rule to sort of find how much this loss reduces when you change x and uh, proportional to how much it is you can decide how much to reduce your loss or how much to like sort of change your weights accordingly if you want to increase the weights or if you want to decrease the weights you basically try to find it using derivatives now a uh, similar thing you can see for the other variable as well we again want to calculate del l by del y and we utilize chain rule for the same one other concept is the concept of a computational graph let's say a neural network uh, is a really complex function but instead if we have a simple function like this as well we can uh, like express it in form of a network now this is not a neural network but this is some sort of network and understanding how this network works can help us understand neural networks better you take as input x y and z and you have some sort of uh, weights here you uh, add x and y and get x and y x plus y here and then you multiply them and get uh, x plus y whole multiplied by z here now you want to calculate what uh, the value of final function uh, partial derivative with x y and z is fine so how you do is you directly know what uh, the derivative is for uh, del of f by del of q like the final value that you get here and then we are utilizing chain rule so let's say q is equals to x plus y so we know del uh, q by del x is 1 del q by uh, del y is again 1 then we define function f as q into z then we again know the value of partial derivatives and then we utilize chain rule to find this out so this is how for these particular values of x y and z we can find out the values of gradients so right after this the animation will start in which we'll use a similar sort of concept of uh, partial derivatives and uh, try to make you understand how exactly it works in a real life scenario of a neural network
before that uh, please ask if you guys have any doubts i'll wait for a minute uh, just ask if you, if you have any doubts hello uh yes am i ahead. audible yes, yes if you're uh, audible please go ahead yeah uh, so does that mean that uh, when we are performing forward forward pass that uh, it is basically uh, you know getting an output and uh, if we are applying backward pass every time it is actually optimizing our neural network and we are getting you know better results and better uh, output so is it uh, the uh, whole ideology of performing whatever we uh, discussed just now yep yep exactly that is a very very good way and very very simple way to put it in the forward pass we just calculate the output and in a backward pass we try to optimize our neural network to get better output there is nothing more and the derivative idea is just one way to uh, optimize our network we sort of find out which uh, weights are influencing the output in what ways and we try to uh, like change it to make the results better yeah uh, i have uh, another question like uh, are the derivatives the math mathematical values every time like you said uh, once uh, in the forward uh, pass that we wish to get an answer in 0 and 1 so uh, yes. every time that we are performing forward pass or backward pass uh the 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 new the junction the neurons that we have are they going to contain the mathematical values or they are going to contain zero or one as the data okay so i think what you're asking is will the neuron contain the derivatives or will the neurons contain uh, the uh, value of the derivatives so no or uh, the neurons will only contain the the weights and the use of derivatives is to adjust what the neurons contain fine so let's see what happens in this one like you uh, let's say these uh, particular weights are some value like w11 etc whatever they are fine you calculate a derivative what you do is you try to subtract that derivative multiplied by some constant from the weight to sort of bring up bring the weight uh, to a better value something which sort of better maps your situation so or uh, the derivatives are something which you calculate then and there subtract and get rid of the weights are something which are the inherent part of the neural network not just training of the neural network so weights will remain the same as they are like as they are fed from the input weights will change uh, with time and the derivatives will be used to change them and whatever the value of the weight is it will remain stored in the nodes the derivatives will be calculated and they will be used for subtracting from the neurons and after that the derivatives will be forgotten okay so derivatives will be forgotten yeah. and the values will also be changed in the neurons yes okay we'll use the derivatives you. yep yep we'll use the derivatives change the values then again calculate new derivatives change it again so a good uh, way to understand it is the graph here uh can you see the graph the multi color graph yeah 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 so what we are doing is we are calculating the derivative and basically subtracting uh, the derivatives of various weights here the weights are just theta not and theta 1 we basically uh, subtracting uh, the derivative multiplied by some constant to try to get to a position of lesser loss this process is called gradient descent we basically have a loss function we try to find the derivative of this loss function with respect to the different types of weights this is something which we do in neural networks as well right we find uh, so not just neural networks uh, even in uh, something as simple as linear regression we basically find the derivative of the loss function and we try to adjust the weights using the uh, those derivatives let cool. me look got for it. got yep. got it thank cool. you cool so let me look for any other doubts is back propagation something related to newton's method uh amit you can say like uh, 
machine learning in general involves uh, math intensive numerical methods but it is sort of different like not not exactly that uh but yeah in newton methods as well we sort of tried to like uh, get to better answers and it's not basically solving uh, something directly and coming to a numerical approximation so the gradient descent is something like that is yes. uh let me look for the doubts i uh, are there any other doubts please feel free to exp, uh, like ask there is no problem like uh, if you want to ask in the chat if you want to unmute and ask either is fine i'll wait a bit more because now we'll look uh, into the animations of how it happens and if you have a clear idea of what happened till now you'll actually be able to understand neural networks like much much better and if you do not understand there might be some problems understanding the animations i think not so we'll take a four or, or five minutes break here uh, i am leaving uh, like uh, like uh, i'm taking a small break here just try to ask whatever doubts you have here or in the chat and after that uh, we'll continue like take this time also to relax a little bit uh, and sort of assimilate in your head whatever uh, was just discussed and feel free to ask any doubts meanwhile Uh, we'll be starting again in a minute so in a minute or so if there are any doubts please ask
yep guys let's get started so i want you guys to focus on this particular network uh very very carefully look at uh, what i'm pointing out so uh, i think you can see these two things like uh, first of all look at whatever uh, like these connected circles are there and whatever like quantities are mentioned on the top right of all of them there is a small bracket and a number written this is basically the layer number x10 and x20 are basically zeroth or input uh, layer elements the uh, elements with uh, like one written on the top bracket are the elements of the hidden layer and these are uh, of the basically second hidden layer and then we are trying to take out the output and calculating the error function e w1 basically tells the first layer of uh, first layer of weights this is the second layer of weights and so on so this is again a fully connected layer you can see there is a, a weight element connecting x1 to both z1 and z2 what z and a are basically you add a particular bias term which we discussed in very very short uh, at the time of discussing fully connected layer to get uh, the next value so is the architecture of this neural network clear to everyone there are two inputs and these are the two layers in question uh, and these uh, these two dots basically represent the neurons we take out the output and we calculate some sort of error function here uh, if there are any doubts regarding this architecture go ahead and ask because now uh, we'll be looking at whatever uh, like is happening inside like at the time of backdrop Yeah, Anshu, I think yeah. you've unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can we go back to the previous slide? Sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Like, uh, what are A one uh, and A two? They uh, they represent like Z one and Z two are two hidden uh, neurons, right? The yeah, first yeah. layer of hidden and Z two uh, Z one Z two in both the layers they are two hidden layers. What is A one and A two just beside that hidden layer representing? Okay, okay. So your question is that if the Z of the Z one Z two things are basically representing the hidden layer, what exactly A is? Fine. Yes, so yes, yes. The yes. thing is here they have given a more open representation of a neuron. The output of neuron is basically given by A one. So you can consider that Z one and A one is basically something constituting a single neuron. but you are getting here to look at the internals of a neuron as well here you get the weighted sum right x1 into w11 giving you z1 and then x2 w12 also adding to z1 what this is saying is this again basically adds a bias to it in z1 and then applies an activation function and then gets to a1 so after all of these three things are done the weighted sum has been added the bias has been added and the activation function has been applied you get the value a a can be considered okay. as an activation layer yeah okay a can be considered as activation layer that was part of the neuron yep 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 like okay. it it is basically depending on whatever convention you have you can uh, consider the activation function as a part of the neuron or you can say that the this is basically the activation layer of the hidden layer the hidden layer is made up of neurons right So every neuron yeah. has this part of activation function. Okay. Okay. Cool. Good, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So if there are any doubts or uh, any other doubts as well, please feel free to ask. Uh, I hope all of you understand what is happening here. We are calculating just a weighted sum. Just upon linear uh, line, like just a line ka equation like that, na three x three x plus four y. So you can just imagine it like this. W one one can be some value three. W one two can be some value four. so you what you are doing here is you get 3x1 plus 4x2 plus some bias term b1 and then you apply some activation function and get this value of a and then a1 and a2 become your inputs and then the same thing happens with the second layer after that you take out the output this is the structure uh, and i hope everyone is clear with that if not uh, just uh, ask it in the chat now we'll look at it uh, in some greater detail here you can see this is layer 1 this is again layer 2 this sort of tells you the layer as i just told you this basically uh, tells you basically next node in layer how exactly weight the naming convention in weights are there is 
next node in the layer and previous node layer number. The next node layer number and the previous node uh, layer number is basically the convention here. So now look at this animation. From the error function, you are calculating the derivative of this, this, and this. So the derivative by utilization of chain rule will be uh, given like this. First, you take this derivative. Then you take the derivative of a with respect to z. Then you take the derivative of z respect to with respect to w. Uh, just look at it again. The error function you want to calculate it, calculate it, calculate its derivative with respect to w11. You can see by the blue lines which were appearing here. And then uh, you can see that uh, first we calculate this derivative, then we calculate this derivative, then the derivative between z1, a1, and then again this derivative. So we do this sort of thing for this neuron as well. So we have calculated the derivatives for this weight uh, 1, 1 uh, the, of the second layer and the weight uh, like 2, 2 of the second layer. So there are four uh, weights in this particular uh, like connecting uh, the there are these four uh, weights sort of connecting these two layers. So you can see here how the derivatives are being calculated for all of these. Now these derivatives will be used in gradient descent. Uh, is there any doubt yet? Is am I making sense? If you if you have some idea of uh, like gradient descent from anything even like linear regression, you will be able to understand it very very easily. I believe there are no doubts. If there are doubts, please feel free to ask in the chat. Now let's move on. What we are doing here is we are trying to make the notation better. So what these uh, like uh, dots in a circle represent is piecewise, element-wise uh, matrix multiplication. The first element uh, multiplies to the corresponding element and so on. so on. There has been no mathematical calculation in this step. We have just uh, bought it into a better notation. Did it make sense? Like just notice how the boxes are being made in this animation. We take the first ones, then we take the second ones because they are being multiplied element wise. And then we take the four values and then we consider this as a four value matrix and see. So now we sort of make a name like uh, the multiplication of the derivatives of uh, the uh, like the first output with respect to the activation uh, layer output. And then uh, the output of the activation layer is partial derivative with respect to the uh, Z1. So multiplying both of them, the output we get, we are calling it the del of this layer, like the partial derivative of this whole entire layer to make the uh, to make the notation simple. Is there any doubt till this? What is happening here is we are multiplying these two partial uh, derivatives together to simplify the notation. What we are seeing here is what are the uh, what is basically the partial derivative of error function with respect to an entire layer. So instead of writing all of these four separately, we are trying to write them together for more compact notation. And we have multiplied and kept this as del L for more com uh, compact notation as well, because these are not weights and we do not require to change the values there. Uh, is there any doubts? Santanu Banerjee is asking what is DA by DZ. So Santanu, uh, just look at the network here. This is basically some A and this is some Z. So what Z is, Z is basically the weighted sum of X1 and X2. It's basically X1 into W11 plus X2 into W12 plus uh, B1. Fine. What A1 is, whatever output you got in Z1 now, you apply the activation function to it. So it's basically Z1 and you apply a function to Z1 and that is A. A is output of uh, activation function when you give Z as input. So DA by DZ will basically give you the uh, like derivative of uh, F of Z with respect to Z. Uh, did that help Santanu? If you have any other doubts, please ask in the chat again. So if you have an idea of what exactly activation is, it's not uh, like, I think you'll be able to understand. 
so here we are trying to look at the derivatives of the first layer so it is sort of complex just look at how the blue line is being traversed we are writing the derivatives and we are supposed to write it in, in both the sides because this activation is being affected by these two lines with respect to the error function initially we just had to consider one derivative here we have to consider this sum as well so this is how we are calculating uh, the derivative is that clear uh, if there is any doubt in this one please ask this is very much similar to how we calculated the derivatives for the second layer i think i'll wait a minute or two here if you have any doubt please ask just try to look at it and understand what is happening there is this particular error function you basically use the chain rule to calculate the derivatives of the uh, nodes which are high weights which are higher up the line you want to calculate its derivative with respect to w11 and so you are utilizing the chain rule to uh, calculate it using the derivatives of something which are basically along the way so here we are basically using the result from the previous uh, few slides like this is basically how we um, like represented the del of l right the uh, like del of the second layer so we are using that particular notation to basically simplify this is just notational sugar there is no uh, mathematics here per se here again we are calculating uh, the weights of the other layers if you are not clear with what just happened look at this animation again and try to understand how we are calculating the partial derivatives to find out uh, like the partial derivative with respect to the weights so here uh, we are simplifying it even more using the dot product as well as uh, the uh, like dot operator syntax so all of this is basically notational sugar i think uh, it's sufficient to look at this particular equation so what is happening here is we get that uh, to calculate the derivative of the first layer initially we had already calculated the derivative of error function with respect to the second hidden layer with respect to the first hidden layer there are these extra terms they are basically z2 uh, by a1 then uh, there is this other term by a1 uh, with, with respect to uh, like z1 then there is z1 with respect to the weights of the first layer itself so this is the expression you do not need to think about this particular derivation that much it's like this expression is not important what is important is how we are calculating the partial derivatives so is there any doubt does anyone want to ask anything if you are if if you want to ask anything please ask we are calculating the partial derivatives as you can see fine i guess there are no doubts so here we are simplifying the notation even more so what uh, like you were asking is c this is how basically uh, like uh, utilizing the definition of the uh, function we can uh, replace the value of del z by del a and so on so in the end uh, after even more simplification we get this as the answer and when we generalize it for a neural network of more than two layers we can easily do that so if we had greater than two layers this particular term would repeat the del l part so uh, it's understandable if you have doubts regarding the uh, like mathematical derivation which just happened uh, you guys will be provided with the slides and you can look at it and ask us doubts uh, even after this session but if there are any doubts regarding the partial derivative parts how we are taking the partial derivative across the neural network please ask right now and uh, neeraj it is sort of dependent on uh, the particular neural network right 
सो लेट्स से कि E1 एंड E2 टू बेसिकली कॉन्स्टिट्यूट दी आउटपुट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल बेसिकली लेट्स से कि दिस पर्टिकुलर न्यूरल नेटवर्क टेक्स एज इनपुट एंड इमेज एंड आउटपुट इफ देर इज अ डॉग इन दैट इमेज द फर्स्ट वन इज अ वेरिएबल which uh, can take two values 0 or 1 and the second one is a variable which basically tells you if it is uh, a cat or not fine so basically getting this entire output into the 0 to 1 range there can be many functions which can be used to calculate that output sigmoid or what not and that particular information is uh, like carried by the derivative deli by del a wala like that derivative basically tells you about uh, that derivative basically includes that information or uh, did that help like uh, even and e2 specifically uh, basically depends on what the neural network is yeah cool so in some cases you simply apply a sigmoid uh, if you are aware what a sigmoid is you know it basically contracts the entire uh, real numbers to basically 0 to 1 so you can use it for binary classification so maybe the last layer is just application of a sigmoid function maybe it is some more complicated function maybe it's softmax or something like that so depending on the neural network what how e is calculated changes so now uh, we'll be moving to uh, this thing called gans generative adversarial networks i hope you have understood uh, the parts of neural network if not just feel free to uh, ask your doubts is there a doubt here while having a backward propagation will we be using the modified value of hidden layer while considering the weight of the next hidden layer uh okay i don't know what your okay i think what your doubt is uh, i'll rephrase your doubt just tell me if it's a doubt let's say in this particular example uh in this particular example we have uh, these layers right like yeah so we have these layers so first of all i calculate the derivatives for the second layer and then i calculate using the values from second layer that derivatives for the first layer so will we use the changed derivatives for the first layer or will we use the derivatives uh, like uh, will we use the derivatives with the unchanged value of the second layer uh, yeah 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 uh, that is my doubt yep yep cool fine so we will use them unchanged so what is happening is first of all we are calculating the derivative right once you have calculated the derivative then subtraction happens okay fine got it yeah so uh, this has a very uh, good concept so if you remember there was this uh, graph in which we were going uh, downhill on the terms of loss function just a second can you see it on the screen right now uh, yeah it's visible so let's say ki theta not is a weight like here there are just two weights so it is obviously not a graph of a neural network it is a very simple graph but let's say ki theta not is basically a weight of the first layer and theta 1 is basically a weight of the second layer fine so when we are coming back and we calculate the derivative of theta 1 we do not have to change theta 1 because here what we are trying to do is we are trying to find the steepest path to get to the uh, lowest point so what gradient descent does is why we are uh, like subtracting the uh, partial derivatives here is it basically gives us the steepest part to the lowest point fine so if you basically change the first uh, point before calculating the derivative for the other point you are not actually sort of doing what it intends you will actually go to a different path now this might be a bit difficult to understand so uh, don't worry about that specific bit just realize that uh, all of them have to work together so we have more defined like descent uh, so we know exactly uh, how we are traveling So now uh, we'll look at GANs, generative adversarial networks. Fine. So uh, now this part is uh, again we won't go into much detail or mathematics of this like we did for neural networks. I believe by now I have established one thing. There's something called a neural network, and we all know that these uh, like pers- these particular networks have given us amazing performance in multiple domains and are fairly useful across like all kinds of things, right? so we know that neural networks can be used for a lot of things so the idea of uh, behind a generative adversarial neural network a gan is basically we are using a neural network to train another neural network 
I want you guys to just think about it once and then uh, follow through with whatever I'm saying. GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. So first of all, what does generative mean? We will be learning a generative model. Now there are two types of uh, classification, generative and discriminative. I'll discuss it in the next slide, what it means. Then, then the training has to be adversarial. What that means is basically uh, there will be a neural network competing against your generative neural network uh, and that will basically lead to training. How that happens, how we use one neural network to train another, I will explain. Uh, and the term network in uh, this GANs basically just means that generative adversarial networks. We are not considering any other model but neural network. So first of all, we generally come across discriminative models. Like let's say ki we are given an image. We are supposed to tell if, if it's a guy or if it's a girl, if it's a cat, if it's not a cat, something like that. So these models which sort of uh, just take something and basically estimate a probability of something being true given the input. Like here X is basically the input image. Y is if the image contains a cat. So this image, this particular model is basically a discriminator model. It just uh, like runs and tells you if uh, a particular Y has a particular value for a given particular value X. So these particular uh, like models just uh, sort of give estimates. They are not used to model the overall probability distribution and they cannot generate a fake sample. Now what you know is like uh, in the current point of time we have robots which basically gives you give you a uh, human like speech. There are AI as virtual assistants and whatnot. So all of these things are basically generating generating some sort of thing. They're generating language. They are generating voice speech something. So we need to find a model. We need to train a model which can basically generate new things. Something which can model the uh, probability space uh, from which it is taking samples from. So that is what a generative model is. Generative model basically generates an output and it does not just uh, like give out a discriminative uh, like uh, outcome on the basis of a particular input. Now our uh, discriminative and generative uh, like Algorithms are a very big topic. Uh, there's whole branch of Bayesian statistics studying the differences and all. But uh, I hope you are you guys are able to understand how uh, like a ba basically what a generative uh, network basically means. So this is a GANs architecture. Now just listen to this very very carefully because it's pretty simple if you try to like understand it. So what we are doing is we take a bunch of real world images. We sample them and we give them to a discriminator model. So what this discriminator model is supposed to do is it will basically tell if the image you gave to this is a real world image and parallelly to giving real world images. You will also give it image uh, that is found by a generator model. Fine. And after that it will try to class like try to tell if the image is real or if it is generated by the generator and it is fake. And uh, like using that using the output of the discriminator, you will basically uh, decide your loss. So let's say ki, uh, initially what would happen is you would just you would not have trained your generator model and the output will basically be something random, right? So if you have a trained discriminator, it will automatically reject it and you will get a high loss. Fine. So uh, this particular loss will then be used to change the values of a generator. So after that uh, what will happen is the discriminator itself is giving some loss and uh, like training the generator. So uh, any doubts regarding that? Did you guys understand what I'm trying to say? This discriminator just tries to tell the difference if the image is basically a real world image of, or it has been generated by the generator. If uh, it uh, sort of uh, predicts that uh, if, if it is able to predict that the generator image is fake, the generator uh, weights are changed accordingly. So the training is being undertaken by another neural network itself. So you first of all basically train uh, the discriminator uh, using real world images and from the side of the generator, you just produce a bunch of random noise and tell it that this particular stuff is not a real image. Like first of all, you train the discriminator uh, on the generator sort of and look at uh, like tell it the uh, tell it that these generator generator generated images are not real 
and then give it real world images and tell it that these images are real so yeah you basically provide it labeled data and train it and how you train the generator is you basically as i said you basically give the input to discriminator and you utilize the loss to sort of uh, like uh, change the generator weights accordingly are there any doubts regarding this this is sort of a little bit complex idea but uh, i think you'll be able to understand yeah in the training of generator if we sort of uh, start giving uh, you know uh, the noises or the uh, fake images not the real world images so in mm -hmm. a way we are uh, harming our uh, generator like we are harming our developed neural network is it what uh, like what i meant is true on harming which one like generator or discriminator no uh, we are harming the uh, generator because in the end it's going to uh, the generator is uh, going to uh, you know decide it's not the discriminator it's the generator which will uh, get the uh, random variables uh, the generator is initialized with some random variables right then it generates something like you have already written the code to generate a image using these random weights now this particular image goes to the discriminator and when the discriminator finds out that this is fake now discriminator has been trained on the generator output it knows that generator output some gibberish like this and it is not a real world image it is a fake image fine so generator finds out that this is fake calculates a loss and then according to that loss the back propagation step happens we change the weights of generator and slowly so slowly generator actually starts to produce images which are such that discriminator is not able to tell that they are not real world images okay got it got it thanks yeah cool so basically we uh, use the discriminator to uh, check if the image is real world or not we train the discriminator and then uh, the discriminator is used to train the generator so this is the mathematics behind that uh, it it basically works on game theory because the discriminator is sort of try to maxim trying to maximize its own reward uh, and its reward is basically uh, if it classifies the generators out uh, like output as fake and the real world output as not fake and the uh, the generator itself its uh, its job is to uh, produce outputs which are basically something uh, like uh, which are basically not uh, which are basically not real images but very very similar to real images and hence are able to fool the discriminator so both of these are adversaries working against each other so that is how uh, gan works and in the course of you know continuous data flow they are both getting uh, advanced like yes. every time every time the generator is able to fool the discriminator it is uh, gaining an upper hand and discriminator sort of uh, discriminating the generated data it is you know getting an upper hand right exactly yeah so both of them are uh, continuously uh, upgrading themselves as a training yep so we are using a neural network to train another neural network that is the concept here so this is sort of the math behind uh, how this sort the entire thing is implemented in terms of mathematical functions it's not that complex if you are aware about even simple logistic regressions but we'll not cover that here for the sake of simplicity you can uh, look at these when we provide you the slides so then there's overfitting we won't go into much detail because we are basically out of time right now the training as compared to a neural network can uh, the training of a neural network as compared to other model is basically a little bit more complex and challenging because a neural network is not necessarily convex it's non convex and the loss function can have more than one minima so when you are trying to do back propagation and you are continuously reducing the error right you can sort of get stuck in some sort of local minima of error and not get to the global minimum uh i hope that is clear so yeah yeah cool so uh, what happens is neural nets are really powerful and with great power comes great overfitting so neural nets are very very notoriously infamous for uh, overfitting the data 
so to prevent the overfitting we can basically reduce the hidden units so hidden units are basically what let the neural network uh, model complex situations if we re- if we reduce the hidden units the neural network will remain simple and general if we limit the size of the weights it will basically again prevent from overfitting this sort of regularization is done also in things as simple as linear regression so uh, and the last thing is we can basically stop early uh, to prevent overfitting so here we are discussing all of that in detail like how it works to basically limit the size of the weights uh, the effects of weight decay and how exactly early stopping works and why it works so that is about it for today i will not discuss this in great detail because it's already uh, time if you guys have any other doubts uh, please ask this slide as well as the slide for the python one uh, will be provided to you uh, and to understand the material of the coming two sessions better uh, and to uh, improve your learning experience please go over uh, these two slides as well as the stuff we sent in the mail uh, you'll be able to learn the material very very quick if there are any doubts regarding the neural network presentation or the python presentation feel free to ask